You're listening to The Human Upgrade with Dave Asprey. Formerly, you're listening to The Human Upgrade with Dave Asprey. You've heard lots on this show about biohacking, about longevity and anti-aging, and aging more slowly than your friends, how to perform better your brain, your body, basically how to win so you have a good life. What if you could do the same things for your pet. I've spent most of my life with pets and or farm animals. Uh, I tend to gravitate towards dachshunds, you know, wiener dogs, uh, because they, well, they think they're big dogs. They don't know that they're little dogs. And there's nothing funnier than seeing, you know, a, a Labrador bossed around by a dachshund. Uh, but I, I think it's hilarious. And uh, they're also just fun dogs. So um, I've all of my dogs, I've had six dachshunds in my life. All of them have lived to at least 15 and sometimes 17 or 18. And smaller dogs live longer. But there are things you can do to biohack your pet. And I've talked about this very briefly, like in the first couple hundred episodes. Um, but I have a longtime friend on, and we are celebrating International Dog Day. Now, I know that uh, everyone, in fact, it's a national holiday mostly around the world, okay? No one's ever heard of International Dog Day, probably unless you're a breeder or a vet. But hey, what the heck? Um, this is my longtime friend, Dr. Gary Richter, who is a well-known veterinarian. He's a best-selling author uh, in a book about pet health. And he's the guy behind Ultimate Pet Nutrition, which is food and supplements. He also does veterinary acupuncture, which is really interesting. And in fact, I'm going to talk with him about uh, one of my uh, one of my experiences with dogs and electroacupuncture and some kind of miraculous level healing that's uh, that's possible. But Gary's also known as America's favorite veterinarian and he has a longevity for cats and longevity for dogs book. Since having a pet makes humans live longer other than goldfish, I don't think those count. Uh, and the jury's out on turtles and snakes or iguanas. I did have an iguana uh, named Skippy, who was four and a half feet long at once in my life. So what we're going to go through for you today is we're going to talk about what supplements your uh, pet should be taking, how you can regenerate your pets. Guys, things that work on pets work on us too with a few differences, but there's a lot of commonalities here. A genetic testing for pets, what's coming in the future Things a lot of people believe about pet diets that are absolutely not true. Just a bunch of other stuff from a top expert in the field. So you can biohack your pets. There's no reason not to do that. So first question, Gary. Is it true that vegan cat food can save the environment? <laughs> it might be able to save the environment, but it sure as heck isn't going to save your cat. Um, <laughs> won't yeah, save the I mean, environment either. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's uh, you know, I mean, cats. Uh, cats are very much obligate carnivores, uh, and trying to turn a cat into a vegetarian is a is a quick route to not owning a cat anymore. Ouch! Isn't it the same? Like trying to turn your kids into vegans is a quick route for having unhealthy kids who don't live as long. Also, uh, you know what? You may be baiting me slightly, as you know I am a vegan. Um, my child is not a vegan, however. Uh, although I do I'm think it can be done if one's careful in a human. <laughs> that was totally me causing trouble. Uh, I know. Uh, <laughs> listeners, you know me, and you know me because we're friends. Uh, listeners know me, know me. I will never miss out on a chance to tease a vegan, and they will not miss out on a chance to tease me because we actually have the same values. You know, we, we've we've come up with different solution sets. Uh, and obviously, each of us you know, has our reasons for it, but uh, it, it's done in the spirit of humor. And the idea is we all want to be healthy. We all want to improve the environment. We all want to reduce suffering in animals. So th those, those are commonalities. Well, let's get into pets. Uh, let's start with cats, even though cats are pretty much evil and want to kill you compared to dogs. I, I just have to put that out there. Um, also, that is me teasing cat lovers. Yes, I like cats too. I'm just teasing you. But uh, how long do cats live today? Oh, uh, you know, I mean, uh, probably the big deciding factor there is, is does that cat live inside or outside? But, but in, you know, an indoor cat living an appropriate lifestyle can le easily live into their late teens, early 20s. Awesome. And what about outdoor cats? Outdoor cats, the statistics are pretty abysmal. The average lifespan of a, of a strictly outdoor cat is three years, four years. Um, is that because and, cars hit them or because they're killing so many birds that at night the birds get together and eat the cats? 
That could be the explanation of a lot of mysterious disappearances. Uh, <laughs> but it is a very, very dangerous lifestyle out there for cats that are outside, uh, whether it's dogs or cars or wild animals or any number of other things. So they're, they're a great hunter, but they're also great at being hunted as well. Yes, exactly. Okay. Yeah, coyotes, uh, that'll do it for you. Yep, okay. that'll do it for sure. What about dogs? From a longevity perspective, I, you, you know, you mentioned a moment ago as far as sort of differences in longevity between small dogs and, and, and larger dogs. And there is a, there is a real difference there, but, you know, I think, I think depending on the breed of the dog, it could be looking at sort of early to mid teens for your average dog. Smaller dogs can go upwards of 20, much, much larger dogs, Great Danes, Mastiffs and whatnot. I mean, for the most part, if you get, if you get 12 years out of those dogs, um, most people are pretty pleased. Have those numbers changed over the course of your career? You know, that's a really good question. I would say they have changed over the course of my career in the sense of the way the way that my patients are cared for tends to have them leaning towards living longer than I think probably the averages are. Um, because I spend a lot of time with with my clients talking to them about what to feed pets, uh, you know, what what medical care they need and what medical care they don't need. As you well know, I mean, you know, there's a lot to be said about Western medicine, but, you know, left to its own devices, Western medicine can do as much harm as it can good. Uh, and that's certainly true in, in, in the veterinary field as well. Uh, you know, so when you start custom tailoring the lifestyle and medical care of animals, you will and do see them live quite a bit longer. It, so it's almost like we can control how long our pets live with decisions we make. Oh, but don't worry, you can't do the same for yourself. Or maybe we could do it for both of us. <laughs> maybe we can, although arguably, uh, I have said on many occasions, I think pushing the longevity envelope is actually easier for our pets than it is for us because we are in 100% control of what goes in their mouths and what medical care they get. If I had somebody handing me every bite of food that I was eating over the course of the day and it was all perfectly balanced and nutritious, I'd be in great shape. Um, I don't have that in my life. Hopefully you do. Um, I don't. Um, but, uh, but our dogs do. And because of that, we have all the, we're really in the driver's seat of, of how to keep these guys healthy. Yeah, we do have more control. Actually, we have as much control over our dog's food as over our, our own. We just don't exercise that control very There's well. There's less willpower I'm, involved. Yeah, I think I'm pretty good at it. And also, you and I aren't going to eat those little Tootsie Rolls that cats manufacture that dogs just keep wanting to eat. <laughs> Why do true. dogs do that? <laughs> you know, I've, I've often said that uh, if somebody wanted to make a medication that all dogs would eat, they would make it cat shit flavored. <laughs> Okay, yes. Yeah, that's a, that's a free business idea for anybody out there who wants to run with that. Uh, do we know why dogs are doing that? Is this some kind of probiotic benefit or are they just gross? Well, I mean, I think it's a combination of gross and the fact that like if you think about, I mean, what cats are largely eating pure protein. So it's not super shocking that a dog might find that tasty. Um, and they're dogs. So they're, you know, they're just a little bit gross. They also <laughs> roll in dead skunks. Yeah, anything that's dead, they're going to roll in. I, I don't understand yeah. that. Actually, I do understand that. I, there, there's reasons that they do it having to do with hiding their scent and all. Yeah. Oldest dog you've ever worked with? 23. Wow, what, what flavor of dog was that? It was a Chihuahua. Ah, those little tiny ones. Those little tiny ones. And, uh, you know, I will say that that 23-year-old Chihuahua was not in great shape at the end. <laughs> I imagine not. She was a bit of a mess, but uh, but yeah, 23 is pretty impressive for a dog. Wow. You might not know the answer to this, and I don't, but is it true for humans? I'm pretty much a Great Dane of a human, but are the little Chihuahua people more likely to live longer than me? <laughs> I don't think so. And if you were a Great Dane of a human, you probably would have been dead 15 years ago. Uh, that's a fair point. Uh, so maybe the size difference doesn't matter. I haven't seen any data about like odds of dying based on your height or your weight. Well, I, with weight I have, but it's more about obesity. Yeah. So interesting. All right. How about cats? Oldest cat you've ever, you've ever cared for? 26, I think. Wow. What's the longest animal of any type you've worked with? Well, I mean, then, you know, I, I, I don't do it as much anymore, but, but, Many years ago, I used to do a lot of work with, uh, you know, with wildlife and to a certain extent, zoo, uh, zoo animals. So, 
you know, now you're talking about like a tortoise that can live well over yeah. 200 years, these sorts of things. Uh, you know, it's, it's fascinating when, uh, when you start thinking about you're working with an animal that might have been around when the Declaration of Independence was signed. That's really cool. <laughs> I was going to get tortoise or maybe a parrot because some of those parrots can be very long lived as well. Yes, they can. Yeah. Okay. What are the major differences between working with uh, dogs and humans? I know you don't work with humans, but you and I are in anti aging masterminds. Like you're interested in living longer. Sure. Uh, so you, you know enough to be dangerous on that front. So what, what, are, what are the big variables that are different? Well, clearly there are differences physiologically between, say, dogs and humans. I mean, to a certain extent, mammals are mammals. Uh, most of the broad strokes apply uh, across species. Mm -hmm. um, probably the single biggest difference uh, is nutrition from the standpoint of, you know, an optimal nutritional profile for a dog is going to be a little bit different than it is for a human. Um, perhaps not as different as some people may think. Uh, it's certainly very different for a cat with them being obligate carnivores. Uh, but, um, but, you know, beyond that, I think the other difference is, is everything is somewhat accelerated in a dog. So, you know, for better or for worse, you're going to see things happen faster. Uh, in your dogs, which also means, and, and, you know, this is so true on the human side as well, you know, the, the earlier you start your interventions, the better off you're going to be. Preventative planning is not something that it is, in, is, is sort of hardwired in us humans. Yeah. You know, we're, we're, we're sort of more programmed to sort of, you know, see the bear chasing after us and run rather than plan for the bear that might be chasing after us. Um, but, but, you know, I mean, Getting those interventions started early is so important with pets because their aging curve is so much faster than ours. It's one of those things where you can spend as much on anti-aging for your pet as you can uh, on a human if you really get into it. And it's well known in the world of business that pet owners, in, at least in the US, they treat their pets uh, kind of like kids, you know, and that the, they'll splurge. In fact, there are people who spend more on supplements for their pets than they do for themselves. Uh, which is uh, which is interesting. It's, it's a measure of how much we we love our pets, how they become part of you know, family members. Really, what's an average monthly spend for a mid-sized dog to keep it young? If you're legitimately going to make some real efforts on the longevity sense, you know, rather than just sort of general veterinary care, if you will. I mean, I think I think you might wind up spending a couple hundred dollars a month uh, yeah. between between food and supplements. Obviously, larger dogs, it's, it's going to cost more. Um, it also depends on how you choose to feed them from the perspective of, uh, you know, are you, are you making food for them, which is going to be less expensive but more time-consuming? Are you buying fresh whole food for them ready-made? Uh, you know, so there's a lot of ways to do it. But, you know, if you're willing to put in a little bit of time, uh, you know, you can do it for most people in a way that's reasonably affordable. Uh, I know that uh, for for my dogs, we made the food for them, but uh, they eat mostly raw meat with a few sure. additives. So, sure. um, but they're small. If they were, you know, Labradors, I think we'd be spending you know, fifteen dollars a day. And I grow my own meat, and I'd be spending fifteen dollars a day. Yeah. I mean, they eat a lot when they're big, so that's a big part of it. Um, you go through in your your book. Uh, you talk about uh, the science of aging for animals. And it's funny, the list that you have is very similar to what I have in Superhuman, my, my big book on longevity. Um, and I have like seven pillars of aging. I think you have closer to 14, but many of the ones you have, like two of them would map into one of the categories I did. Can you, or maybe we could just go through the list of things that make, uh, that make a dog or a cat old and just talk about those briefly and then Later on, we'll talk about what we can do to, to get into this. Yeah, let's do that. And I'll just, just, just for the sake of mentioning it, the only reason why there's more pillars of aging in my book than in Superhuman is because the research has advanced since you wrote that book. Yeah. I, so I was like looking at the old. exact same research that you did. There's just yeah. more of it now. Yeah. Uh, there is absolutely more and it's exploding. It, it's really cool. Uh, yeah. So at, at some point, uh, books are going to turn into... Uh, AI constantly updated references, uh, they, they almost have to. Uh, because, I mean, if I rewrote Superhuman today, I'd probably add a couple more chapters about anti-nutrients that are apparently 
uh, behind things. I'd add some more stuff about immune function that we just didn't know or weren't included in the field yet. So it, it's a constant evolution, and that's why I, you know, I, I do masterminds and you know the conference and all that, just so I can share the latest, even just on social media. Sure. So, so uh, let's start out with genomic instability. What is it, and is it the same thing that humans have? It is exactly the same thing. And, and, you know, I mean, all of these hallmarks of aging are, they are the same, but I mean, genomic instability, as, as, as you know, I mean, the genome is, is literally your, your genetic code, your DNA. Um, and, and, you know, as we grow and as we age, our cells are constantly turning over and they're replicating and old cells are recycled, what have you. And in this whole process, uh, there are occasionally errors that happen in DNA replication. Now, the body has all manner of ways to sort of deal with that and correct those errors. Uh, but over time, part of aging is, is those errors tend to pile up. And as those errors in your genome pile up, what you wind up with is you wind up with proteins that are either not made or made incorrectly or proteins that are made that shouldn't be made. And as a result you wind up with a body that does not function as optimally as it should. And that's really the root of genomic instability is, is the code that is telling our body what it needs to do and when is not as set and as stable as it should be. Okay. And this is a standard part of aging. And we can handle that with things that protect, either encourage turnover or things that protect DNA from damage. What's the yeah. best thing for dogs or cats that, that does that? You know what? I mean, the best thing, and this is going to be this is going to be kind of across the board for many of these hallmarks of aging. The best thing that we can do is is optimize their diet. Um, optimized nutrition is going to be the foundation for all of this. I mean, we can talk about we can talk about senolytics, and we can talk about things that that help stabilize the genome from a from a biochemical sense. But at the end of the day, you know, our body is running on fuel that we put in it, and the same thing is true for our animals and and if we're putting in the wrong fuel, you're going to wind up getting the wrong results. Okay, so it's all about the food. Uh, can you buy a dry grain-based dog food that will keep your dog young? No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I was hoping you would say that. Um, it seems like modern uh, dog foods and, and probably cat foods um, they're putting really low quality protein in and they're filling it with crap and they're using bad oils and they're even using recycled animals that have been euthanized with the chemicals they use to euthanize the dogs at the very low end. So, so there's, you just don't know what's in it, right? Yeah. I mean, the, the whole pet food industry is, I mean, is quite frankly a mess and you know, everything you just said is true. Although the pet food industry will vehemently deny the part about uh, euthanasia chemicals in the food, but the oh, research is what it is. It's I mean, it's Pfizer there. would deny euthanasia chemicals in some of their products too. But hey, you know. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but you know what I mean. The bottom line is, is the pet food industry is obviously it is a for-profit business, and in every for-profit business, the the calculus is is. How do I sell the most amount of food and spend the least amount of money doing it? Um, oh my God, that's exactly what big food is doing, right? And we're seeing yeah. the same effects. If you allow them to do that to your pets or to you, you know, you get what you're paying for. Yeah, you very much do. And and you know, I mean, you know, you can blame it all day long on on sort of the advertising and the marketing and about how these products are are, are sold. Um, unfortunately my own industry bears a fair bit of responsibility here because your average mm -hmm. veterinarian is telling their clients to feed exactly that food. Uh, wow. Because unfortunately, that's how we're educated in vet school. Uh, you know, your average veterinarian and your average physician doesn't get much by way of nutritional training in school. Um, and while I can't speak to physicians after they go to school, I can tell you that most veterinarians are getting their updates on nutrition from either conferences where the research is funded by big pet food or by the, the rep that walks into the office from Hills, Purina, Imes, what have you. That's where that information is coming from. It, it's almost like there's this really good business model that works with uh, medical professionals of any flavor, which is when you teach them that the only way to heal things is to buy your products and then you mandate that with regulatory uh, oversight and standards and things like that. And then all of a sudden you end up with sick animals or people. And then 
that makes more profit for you. Yeah, and you know what? And, and combine that with you take a group of very, very busy, overworked professionals and give them yeah. very easy, simple solutions to offer to people. Yeah, and these are people who mean well. And, and this is not an attack on, on the medical profession, on the doctors themselves, but the infiltration of it with commercial interests has just got to stop. Yeah, and um, I appreciate you saying that because, I mean, I think a lot of people go down the road of they think there's some conspiracy amongst doctors and veterinarians. No. There isn't. No, uh, I, I am dear friends with so many doctors and they're frustrated. They, they don't like it any more than you or I like it. Yeah. Right? And well, we're all so, trapped in that system. Yeah. Well, yeah. I think the system is collapsing under its own weight and something, uh, something dramatic will happen over the next few years over this because, uh, well, no one wants to pay for things that don't work. And no one built that into the business model that, oh, you know, if you lie to people for long enough, maybe they'll notice you're lying and then they won't listen to anything you say. And if you try and force them to buy your stuff, that's when they get their pitchforks. So, <laughs> you know, if I was a, a betting man, I would be betting on pitchforks right now versus um, you know, pharmaceutical companies for dogs or pets. Because Is that on torches and pitchforks or just pitchforks? You know, torches apparently raise CO2. And if you believe that CO2 is more important than atrazine, which is feminizing our dogs, cats, and our kids, um, well, yeah. Maybe LED torches then. <laughs> oh, so Burning Man. I got gotcha. you. There you go. Okay. <laughs> now, that's genomic instability. Telomeres. Pets have telomeres. Humans have telomeres. Do you measure telomeres? So that is not something that um, is being commercially done right now. It can be done in sort of a research setting. Uh, I'm actually having a conversation with, uh, with a physician that you and I are both friends with mm -hmm. uh, about working on not only getting that done, but looking at a very specific telomere lengthening supplement uh, as well. Some of the telomere lengthening supplements that are out there on the market for people, um, they almost certainly would work in dogs and cats as well, although that hasn't really been researched. Um, a lot of the really effective telomere supplements out there are very expensive. Yeah. Um, so they, uh, you know, they're not necessarily high on the list for most people. Uh, and then, of course, there's this question that, of course, you are well aware of about, you know, sort of this, this question of how directly telomere length correlates to longevity. Um, I think it's part of the bigger picture. Is it probably the one metric we should all be looking at? No. Um, but I think it is a big picture issue. It's an important metric. The problem yeah. is that telomere from a blood test doesn't matter very much because blood telomeres bounce all over the place. So if you get a brain telomere or a cardiac telomere, just by you know going in with surgery and taking a little chunk of the brain out, I'm sure it would be a good measure. Since I don't want to do that because that seems to not be good for longevity either, I take my telomere, uh, telomere test with a, a grain of salt. Because I've seen the move by 20 years in two weeks. Yeah. And I don't think that's a measure of magic biohacking, although that might help a little bit. I think it's a question of just uh, problems with where we're getting the telomeres we measure and how we measure them. Agreed. Okay. All right, let's talk about mitochondrial dysfunction. That one's high on the list because, I mean, mitochondrial dysfunction sort of sits right at the crux of so many other problems, right? I mean, if your cells are not effectively and efficiently creating energy, then where are you? So yeah, I mean, I think mitochondrial dysfunction is a big one. That's another one that diet plays a big part in. But certainly, you know, there's plenty of supplements out there that are easily and readily available, things that a lot of people may be using for their pets already. Easy stuff like, um, like curcumin. Um, mm -hmm. Curcumin is, is, is one of the great miracles of nature from a supplement perspective. Um, and it, and it touches on so many hallmarks of aging, but mitochondrial dysfunction is a big one. Uh, and I bring up curcumin because it's readily available. It's inexpensive. If you get, you know, a, a, a bioavailable compound, uh, you can do an enormous amount of good for pets. And I use it all the time, uh, in my patients. I want to be really clear though, when you say curcumin, that's extract of turmeric, because if you're using whole turmeric, it's very high in oxalic acid, which will clog up a dog's kidneys faster than a human's, although it does it to both of us. So it's the extract that you use, right? It, it is. And furthermore, like if you're feeding whole turmeric, it's not really absorbing anyway. Yeah. Um, curcumin is very, very poorly absorbed in its natural state. 
and and you know, there's all kinds of stuff online that you can look at uh, about like sort of combining ground turmeric with things like coconut oil and black pepper. And while yes, that will improve the absorption to an extent, uh, it's not really all that much. And then there's also some question about you know, I mean, the reason why that works is because is is because the compounds in the black pepper. Uh, are increasing the ability to absorb all kinds of things um, through through liver pathways, and there may be some other things that you're allowing to get absorbed in that process that you don't really yeah. want to. So that's not really the best approach. I, and black pepper by itself doesn't do too much of that, but it's higher in aflatoxin and oxalate, yeah. uh, which neither one of which is good for dogs. But black pepper extract, uh, bioperine, is a supplement ingredient that I've been campaigning to get removed from supplements because it will increase your gut's absorption of everything, including yes, exactly. polysaccharides. So if your dog eats cat poop and then you give them a, a black pepper extract, a curcumin capsule, they will absorb more of whatever's in the cat poop. And if you yeah. take it, you'll absorb more of your pharmaceutical drugs and all of whatever else is in your gut. It's not technically leaky gut, but it's an increase in membrane fluidity in the lining of the stomach and then in, in, in hip uh, inhibition of the liver. So that's something I would steer away from in dogs, cats, or people. No, I agree. I mean, you're, you're, you're effectively sort of cutting out the natural safeguards that the body has in there. Um, yeah. In the interest of absorbing one compound, which you could get in them, a, a, you know, a myriad of other ways. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it, it does work though. It will increase absorption. It's just, yes. there, there, it comes with a large downside, which is yes. why um, I work on that. And from a mitochondrial perspective, about 70, 80% of all of the things on your, your list of things that cause aging in animals, when you boil them down, fixing mitochondria fixes things like, you know, uh, proteostasis, uh, even genomic instability, better mitochondria will repair your, your genetics when they can. And cellular senescence and stem cell exhaustion, autophagy, all of those are mitochondrial powered or in origin. So I always look at how do I do that? I used yeah. to give my, uh, my uh, last dog um, who passed a few years ago, uh, his name was Merlin. He would get coenzyme Q10. He would get krill oil. Uh, he would get... Uh, let's see, some of the compounds like astaxanthin, he'd get four mm -hmm. milligrams of astaxanthin, which yep. I take for eyesight. Uh, he was already blind congenitally, but we gave him that for uh, mitochondrial function. Uh, he got collagen, he got sea salt, he got magnesium and raw meat and a little MCT oil and yeah. a sprinkling of collagen on top. What was I yeah. missing? Uh, I mean, you got you got enormous stuff there. I mean, the, you know, the, the funny thing about natural medicine is like, there, there's always one other supplement you can find to add in. Um, oh, I know what it was. It was, uh, I gave him vitamin Dake, a D A K N E. And yeah. I also gave him a broad spectrum mineral supplement. The stuff I wrote about in uh, my most recent book in Smarter Not Harder. Yeah. I, I mean, and I think that that is a, uh, that is an, an outstanding spectrum of things to give. I mean, another thing, and I wouldn't be surprised if you're about to tell me you were doing it anyway. Um, ozone therapy. Uh, you know, I didn't usually stick things up their butt um, because they just didn't seem to like it. But if they were sick, yeah, ozone therapy is really potently effective for dogs and for yeah, people. Ozone's and, great. Um, mm -hmm. And that is actually something that people can do at home. Um, hyperbaric oxygen is a little bit more challenging for your average person. Yeah. Um, we, but we that is that. also a really great, a really yeah. great sort of vehicle to do that with. One of the test uh, things for Upgrade Labs, and Upgrade Labs, by the way, we haven't caught up. We are now... Uh, opening in 15 locations as a franchise and many more coming. So you, you guys can go to ownandupgradelabs.com if you want to learn how to open a biohacking facility. But one of the pieces of gear that I tested that's not in the franchise would rapidly cycle atmospheric pressure up and down uh, to help cell membrane function. And we, we tried putting them in there, but I think they have a hard time clearing their ears. So that wasn't a, a great success. Fair enough. Yeah. I mean, they do, they do really well in a hyperbaric chamber, but uh, like rapid up and down cycling sounds challenging. Yeah, that wasn't the right answer, but uh, yeah, the hyperbaric, he would just go in there and sit, uh, sit with us when we wanted to do it. Yeah, usually they fall asleep. They get bored and fall asleep. Now, I want to share a, a, a story about Max, uh, one, of my other, one of my other dachshunds. Because you're an acupuncturist, we'll go a, a little bit sideways. I'm going to explain what, what you think happened here. 
Uh, Max was a dappled piebald, which means he was a dachshund who was white with black cow spots, but the black cow spots were kind of dappled. He had one blue eye, one black eye. Honestly, the most striking looking dog I've ever seen. Also the biggest jerk on the planet because <laughs> to get the colors, they breed in rat terrier. So he was like a neurotic dachshund who thought he was a terrier, which meant that he ruptured his disc in his spine in two places and was incontinent and dragging his back legs like a mermaid. So the local vet said, well, $10,000 in neurosurgery and maybe he'll be able to walk again. I'm like, uh, that's a lot of money. And that's also not a great outcome. So we took him in for electro acupuncture. Mm -hmm. And that means that they put the, the needles in around the places on the spine, ran a very gentle current. And we had him do a treadmill therapy in warm water, like basically yeah. bathtub treadmill therapy. Sure. And it took about two months and about 800 bucks. And he fully restored all function to where he was walking, running, fully continent, and lived another nine years after that without any more problems. So fully paralyzed dog, paralyzed for three months, recovered with acupuncture, electricity, and treadmills. What happened? Sure. Well, I mean, gosh, there's so much to say here. Um, for starters, dachshunds are not what Mother Nature intended. <laughs> You think? <laughs> Biomechanically, they're just not put together very well, and they're a back problem waiting to happen. Yeah. They really need like a fifth leg right in the middle to support <laughs> that back. Or maybe yeah. a wheel. You know, yeah, like a, str a strap-on wheel would work also. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I mean, it, there's all levels of, uh, of back issues and blown discs, um, and, you know, clearly that's a very common thing uh, yeah. in, in dachshunds in particular. Uh, you know, but as long as they have as long as the disc rupture was not so severe that their spinal cord was just destroyed in the process, mm -hmm. a lot of times it's a question of, can you get the pressure off of the cord by getting the disc to go back into place? Um, and then can you go ahead and return neurologic function? And, you know, sometimes surgery is a way to do that. I wouldn't knock it. Um, but it can also, in many cases, be done without, um, you know, both the, the electroacupuncture, the treadmill therapy, the rehab therapy, that's all stuff we do in my office. So we see these kinds of things play out a lot. And, and really what you're doing with, with acupuncture and particularly electroacupuncture is you're decreasing inflammation, you're increasing blood supply to the area, which is going to allow those tissues to heal. Um, and as you decrease the inflammation and the muscle spasm around those spinal segments, what you're doing is, is you're decreasing the pressure and you're allowing that disc material to sort of settle back where it mm -hmm. belongs and off of the spinal cord. And then at that point, mm -hmm. it's a question of effectively retraining those damaged nerves to do what they need to do. I mean, nerve tissue is understandably delicate. Uh, and, and when it gets banged around and damaged, it needs a little, a little assistance. So, you know, physical therapy is a great way to do that. An underwater treadmill is one of the greatest inventions that ever happened in veterinary medicine. Um, because what you can do is you can get these animals walking in such a way that they don't have to bear full weight. Um, so effectively it's gait retraining. It's yeah. teaching their body from a neurologic input perspective, how to walk. Uh, in a way that they can do it because they're kind of floating. I mean, in my office, we would have added um, hyperbaric oxygen on top of that to flood that spinal segment with oxygen to allow that tissue to heal because anytime that there's loss of blood supply to an area like there's going to be with a blown disc, oxygen becomes the rate-limiting step to tissue healing. So whenever, you know, just getting oxygen to that area makes an enormous benefit I would have put your dog on, you probably already did this, but we would have put him on, on antioxidants. You mentioned astaxanthin, um, omega fatty acids, curcumin, boswellia, all kinds of things that are going to naturally mitigate that inflammatory response and just promote, promote healing. You know, the great thing about a biological system is at the end of the day, if you give it half a chance, it wants to heal. The comparison I often make is if my car is broken, and I let it sit there, it will always be broken. Nothing will ever happen. With a biological system, if you give it enough time and you get the right nutrients anywhere close to that biological system, they're going to find a way to fix it. And that's, that's the great benefit of working with a biological system is I don't have to know how to fix everything. 
oftentimes I just have to give it a nudge in the right direction and my patient will take it the rest of the way. That is so true. And, and it's true in humans too. Sure. Uh, you talk about gait retraining. I did a documentary uh, oh, about, I want to say almost two years ago, um, daveasprey.com slash heal is the, the URL. But I did surgery, bone surgery on my foot from an old yoga injury. And I healed twice as fast as uh, you're supposed to, which is cool. But I still had to do the gait retraining. Uh, but I didn't have an underwater treadmill. Uh, but I worked actually very extensively with someone who's great at foot fascia work until I finally learned how to big bend a toe that had never bent right, like in seven or eight years. Yeah. Um, so none of it's conscious. It's all unconscious movement stuff until you become conscious of it. And it's the same with dogs, same with cats, I imagine. Although getting a cat into a water treadmill seems like that might be a bit of a challenge. We've done it, but it takes a very, very special cat. <laughs> not, not every cat is going to be okay with that. Like, if you think about it, what we're really doing is, is we're putting an animal in a box that slowly is filling with water. It's like a James Bond torture thing. <laughs> you know, like you're just waiting for the sharks with the laser beams to start swimming around. Right, right. Um, so it takes a very particular disposition of cat to be okay with that. Um, you know, but to your point about gait retraining, the other thing that actually is a little bit more challenging with animals is is, you know, for, for you and me, if you have a bad foot, you don't really have a choice but to figure out how to walk on that foot. With a four-legged animal, it's actually very easy to become a three-legged animal. Yeah, A three-legged stool still works. It's a dog named tripod. It's an old Yeah, joke. exactly. So the thing is, is like once a dog or a cat gets comfortable on three legs, even if the other leg is completely healed, sometimes they don't want to put it down because in their brain, they've already patterned their gait elsewhere. Mm-hmm. So you had so retraining them takes some real work. Yeah, I, I can see that. It, it's cool that we can do it, uh, and it's yeah. cool we can do it for ourselves too. And and really for humans, I think biofeedback is a way to do it. It's amazing what you can get a dog to do with peanut butter. Oh man, is peanut butter good for dogs though? It seems like it's got all the aflatoxin, all the bad fats, all the lectins. Uh, all I the think octoid. it's the uh, in, in in my case, it's the lesser of two evils. Wouldn't liver paste be better for them? Liver paste might be better for them. All right. That, that's I'll, what I'll take I that saying. under advisement. <laughs> I don't know how <laughs> no liver paste all over my finger, but okay, I, I got you. You own a liver paste production company, sir. I, I, I own a farm. You squeeze the cow, liver paste comes out. I think it's liver paste. It's like a tube. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Let's talk about lab testing for animals, uh, dogs and cats. Uh, sure. What do we do that's different between, uh, between dogs and cats? So we do not have the degree of extensive testing available commercially uh, in animals that we do in people. There are certainly things that we can do. Um, commercially speaking, you can't really, for example, get your dog or your cat's entire genome run, but there are companies out there that will run tests looking for very specific genetic markers uh, you know, that, that may predispose them to certain types of medical conditions, whether it's heart disease, kidney disease, back issues. Uh, these sorts of things. So these are really good tests for people to run, especially when their pet is younger. Uh, so for example, if you find out that your dog, say, is genetically predisposed to mitral valve disease, which is a heart problem, uh, that doesn't by definition mean they're going to die of heart disease, but it does mean that it's something that we can keep an eye on. We can look at supplementation to keep their heart muscle strong, etc. So we can do that. We can do epigenetic age testing, which again, uh, you know, you could talk all day long about whether or not that's really going to sort of directly correlate to how long they're going to live, but it's a nice objective measure mm -hmm. to, to measure sort of how we're doing from a treatments perspective, a supplement perspective, uh, you know, to, to get an idea of is what we're doing actually working. So we can do that. Um, some of the even easier things that can be done that really, unfortunately, are not being done a lot in veterinary medicine are things like omega fatty acid testing, uh, vitamin and mineral levels, vitamin D, B vitamins. Uh, these things are so easy uh, to do. And, you know, take vitamin D, for example. You were asking earlier about the, sort of the differences between people and animals. Uh, when it comes to vitamin D, there's actually a really big difference because vitamin D is a purely nutritional thing when it comes to dogs and cats. There's no sunlight conversion with dogs and cats, which kind of makes sense when you think about it. If they're 
covered with fur, what's the point? So many of my patients, even the ones eating what I would consider to be a really, really high quality diet, you test them, they're still low in vitamin D. Uh, and vitamin D has enormous impact on multiple hallmarks of aging, um, not the least of which being, uh, you know, the effects that it appears to have as far as the prevention of cancer. Uh, so, so, you know, making sure that these guys are, have adequate amounts of something as simple as vitamin D and omega fatty acids can have a huge impact on their quality of life and their lifespan. And that's a very easy thing for people to test for. It's easy to test for. And if you think about it, where is vitamin D in an animal? It's mostly in the skin. So if you're like my, my older breed of dachshund who would just love to catch gophers and eat the entire gopher if, if they could get away with it. It was like a, watching a boa constrictor eat something. <laughs> I don't know how a dachshund eats a gopher, but geez, they smell bad after they do it. But they're getting all of the vitamin D what, because it's made in our skin, right? I don't know if gophers make vitamin D underground, but whatever. They're eating entire animals when they can and getting all of that. But when we feed them muscle meats and ground up whatevers, they probably aren't getting much of the parts of the animal that have vitamin D in it uh, in commercial foods. Yeah. And you know what I mean? I think getting back to the whole conversation about pet foods, when you look at sort of nutritional analysis and nutrition, nutritional requirements for pet foods, you know, there are requirements to make sure that pet foods have a certain amount of vitamin D in them. But we're talking about the amount of vitamin D is to make sure that they don't get rickets, right. to make sure that they don't have a clinical vitamin D deficiency. There's a difference between not getting a vitamin D deficiency and an optimal level of vitamin D. There's a world of daylight between those two places. Um, so there's no reason, there's no motivation for pet food companies to put extra vitamin D in there um, because it's just, it's, it's more money and it would, quite frankly, it would look strange on the nutritional analysis if it said like their product had 500 times the recommended amount of vitamin D in it people would ask questions because people don't understand the concept of nutrition and the fact that that's actually a good thing. Yeah, uh, it, it takes a lot of marketing to explain uh, supplements to people. And surprisingly, the pharmaceutical industry just keeps making it harder and harder to speak truthfully. Uh, I know up in Canada, uh, where I'm based, uh, where my farm is, man, they just took away human access to a whole bunch of supplements just with a regulatory swipe of the pen. And of course, that's funded by Big Pharma. Um, what I was doing is I was giving human supplements to my dog. But there have been times in the past three years when people have considered using pet supplements or medications for humans out of an urgent need. Mm -hmm. Is there any safety consideration? Like, like is if it's a pure drug you give a dog, is it the same one you give a human or do they add like impurities to it for dogs? Yeah, I mean, generally it's the same. I mean, you know, a lot of animal-based supplements, needless to say, are going to be sort of uh, flavored. So, you know, if you don't mind your vitamin being liver flavored, you know, that, that, that <laughs> may be fine. Um, generally speaking, outside of that, I think the, the, other, the other real consideration is just dosing. Uh, and, and really the concern would be like, it would be more of giving, uh, giving an animal, a human product purely from the standpoint of you might inadvertently be overdosing with something. It, it would, it'd be very easy for a small dog. So we would slice a supplement open and put a couple drops of, of, of vitamin Dake on it instead of um, putting the whole capsule. Cause you know, a, a 15 pound dog doesn't need the amount of vitamin D that a hundred pound human needs. No, uh, uh, you know, and that's, and that's very true. And, and, you know, I mean, vitamin D for as beneficial as it is, it is theoretically possible to over supplement vitamin D yeah. um, and over supplementation of vitamin D could literally kill you. Um, so a very, you know, very large over supplement because they, they do 500,000 I use once a month in humans and it doesn't kill them. Yeah. You'd have to, you'd have to work at it. But if you think about it, like if somebody decided they were going to give their 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 small dog a human vitamin D supplement, you know, over months or years, it, you could you could calcify good. their kidneys. It could be yeah. done. Most, um, especially and I, if and they're I on a plant based diet or they're eating grains, because the primary calcifier of kidneys is oxalic acid, which is found in plants and not animals. So there's that. So there's that. So you know, I think on the one hand, human supplements and animal supplements absolutely can sort of cross boundaries. Right. Um, but I think people do, you know, 
there is a certain degree of appropriate due caution. Every medical professional and nutritional pharmaceutical company out there, I'll say that people should consult with their veterinarian before they do anything like that. But I will also couch that with saying that your veterinarian might not actually know how to answer that question. That's a really good answer. Um, it's not like in vet school they're going to tell you these are the exact same drugs they give to people. They just cost 10% as much for animals. Um, like there was a, because I, I actually commercially do raise sheep uh, and I do deworm my sheep. So I actually had a large supply of commercial dewormer on hand because you do that every year. And I yeah. was looking at it going, hmm, I wonder. And I couldn't get a clear answer about whether that you would want to use that in a human or not. But since it's the same chemical and there's nothing else in there, logic dictated that it was probably okay, but I don't yeah. know, right? Okay. Well, yeah, but the, the difference is, is you're smart enough to do the math and figure out the dosing. Because you saw those, those, those reports that came out on the news oh, yeah. during COVID when people were causing neurologic problems in themselves. Oh, yeah. They were taking huge doses because they, they just didn't know what they were doing. Yeah. Well, you know, and the, the, the problem with ivermectin is if you, if you misplace a, a decimal... I hadn't thought of ivermectin. What a good idea. Yeah. If, let's you, talk if you misplace a decimal, somebody's going to die. It's like that. Like you can't, like a 10 times overdose. Yeah. Bad things are going to happen. Yeah. And it, it's true for all drugs, you know, and even supplements, you got to take the right dose. So yeah, people, people can and will do things that are not in their best interest thinking it's in their best interests. I mean, I was a raw vegan for a while, which was in my best interests. See, now I'm teasing you again. You're not raw. <laughs> nod, nod, wink, wink. No, I'm not wrong. <laughs> I'm, I, and thank you for answering that. I know that could be a, a touchy, a, a touchy answer there. If you could do one thing for a dog, the very first thing to have it live longer, what would it be? Feed them a properly balanced, fresh, whole food diet. What does whole food mean in the context of dogs or cats? So for me, whole foods means minimally processed. Oh, so, but not the entire food. Okay. That could look like raw food. Uh, I'm okay with lightly cooked food. Um, mm -hmm. I think that there are there are definitely animals out there that seem like they do better on lightly cooked versus raw. It really depends. I think the magic is in minimally processed whole foods. It's funny because like we all know intuitively that the more processed food we eat, the worse that tends to be for our health. But you know, when you look at at kibble or canned food for pets. There's no way around the fact that that is highly processed food, even far beyond what is sort of normal for processed food for people. And yet that's what people feed their dog or their cat every single day for their entire life. And then we wonder why the wheels fall off the cart later. Mm -hmm. To me, that is the foundation of the entire longevity discussion. You, know, you can talk about you know, stem cell therapy and regenerative medicine and all kinds of fancy stuff. But if you're building that on a foundation of I'm feeding my dog grain-free kibble, then you're not really doing a whole lot of good. Well, the grain-free kibble is probably better than grain-based kibble. Right? That there, there are even degrees of badness of junk food for dogs. Agreed. Um, one thing that, that I noticed... Um, dachshunds are known for being food obsessed, um, probably as much as Labradors. And my entire life, you, know, you drop something on the floor, they're like a, a missile running in, they're biting it. Uh, they do commercial <laughs> feeding when there's two dogs, or they like they kind of toss it up in the air and throw their body over it to swallow it faster. I mean, it's yes, it's pretty much like I would have been in seventh grade um, at a, at a pizza bar, but. Once I started adding MCT oil, the C8 MCT brain octane, um, to the dog's food after I interviewed a vet about it a long time ago, this like calmness came over the dogs where they weren't food obsessed. They ate, but they ate at a normal rate. And the rest of the time, they were less stressed. Talk to me about MCT oil and dogs and cats. I mean, MCT oil in dogs and cats has a lot of the same benefits that that it would uh, that it would in humans, both from this standpoint of being being a, a, a high quality fat, being a medium chain triglyceride. Um, you know, obviously, uh, brain octane is a very specific, uh, you know, MCT. That's the C8 uh, MCT for people listening, and it just brain yeah. octane is the trade name that I made for bulletproof because I'm like, oh, it fuels your brain. Like, let's give it a name that describes that. But a, a pure C8 MCT from coconuts is what I'm talking about. Yeah. So, um, you know, great natural anti-inflammatory. And I think 
you know, clearly fat in the diet is going to have a large effect on satiety. It's going to have a large effect on how hungry, uh, you know, these animals feel. And, and, you know, when you're, it's interesting because you look at, particularly you look at, at dogs that are eating, eating kibble, which is most of them, uh, you know, kibble is generally speaking somewhere in the ballpark of plus or minus 60% carbohydrates. So what happens when we as humans eat enormous amounts of carbohydrates? We're constantly hungry. Big surprise there uh, that that is also the case with animals. Now, certainly there is a food drive that, that is present in some dogs that is, that is pretty <laughs> intense. I mean, your average Labrador eats like every meal is going to be their last because one never knows when Armageddon might happen. So you might as well enjoy it. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, there is also something that is just systemically calming and balancing about medium chain triglycerides. Uh, it does seem to, to really help them just, just be, be less obsessive, less, you know, less intense, uh, particularly when it comes to food. And I think it's a combination of that balancing effect and that satiety effect that they just don't feel like they're starving. Right. I was talking with a friend the other day. I I finally got her to eat more protein. Uh, Someone who's been low on protein. And she came back and and said, I've been diagnosed with a binge eating disorder since I was 18 years old. And after three days of adding more protein and some MCT, um, I'm not hungry anymore. And for the first time in my life, I don't have a gnawing background hunger that I'm constantly fighting against. And I don't know what to do with myself now because I've never actually experienced the state of not being hungry. And I kind of feel like we create that state um, in our pets of just constant gnawing hunger that can never be satisfied and eat a whole bag of kibble until they're, you know, they're like a stretched skin. You can, you can, they're like a drum and they're still hungry because it's not food. Right. No, I agree. And, you know, and, and couple that with sort of just this, this kind of American cultural thing where, where food is love. That's how we show our affection to the dog is by mm-hmm. feeding them. And thus they are conditioned to be looking for food because that's, that's where their affection comes from. Uh, where instead, you know, if it were, I love you, let's go out for a 30 minute walk. That would be a very different sort of life view from that dog's perspective, but but we train them and we condition them to look for food. Yeah, that's a fair point. So it's all about the food when it comes to dogs and cats. It's a lot about the food. Yeah, yeah. well, it, it is. Your list of supplements uh, from your book is impressive, um, and you talk about the right kinds of supplements. It's a good twenty-five things. I take all of those things uh, myself, except uh, I don't take uh, oleoropine. I feel like it's a type of... That's a mouthful, but uh, olive leaf extract. No, I do take olive leaf extract. Okay, got it. It's just, I have the... the, uh, I was trying to be technical and scientific. Wow. That's like when they put the the species of cricket on the back (laughs) of the food packaging when they're trying to trick you into eating bugs. Yes. uh, So they can get protein. All right, got it. I also don't take ashwagandha anymore. Uh, and I don't take berberine. Uh, other than that, everything else on your list is stuff that I take, which is really cool. And the yeah. list is in um, is in your book. Yes. Uh, and uh, I will, with your permission, I, I'd put the list and a link to your book for the show notes for this, just so listeners can see what we're talking about here. Sure. Okay. Cool. And we'll we'll, we'll make sure to link back to you on that. Uh, and it's funny. It's got vitamin D. It's got spermidine, which I, I've, I've been a, a very big voice in getting spermidine into the anti-aging movement here in the U.S. In fact, I wrote about it before you could buy it here. Uh, you put NMN, which is nicotinamide mononucleotide. Now, most recently in the U.S., this is an NAD precursor. I've done lots of shows on it. Um, it's now no longer available um, over the counter because of some pharmaceutical uh, interventions and all. There's a, a bunch of drama about that. Can Dogs and cats still take NMN or do they have to take nicotinamide riboside, which doesn't seem to work as well? <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's a good, that the, obviously that's all sort of happened fairly recently, uh, this whole NMN thing. Um, and it is, it will spare the discussion on how all that happened because it's weird and, and yeah. not, bit, really, re- not really relevant. Yeah. 
but yeah, I mean, they can take NR. Um, I think that there there are going to be sort of other other derivations of NMN that are going to sort of make themselves known. Yeah. Uh, that will that will serve a similar purpose. And and just to your point about the list of supplements in the book, and you know, I said this in several places in the book, but you know, just so people understand. I'm not advocating for people to give their dog all 25 supplements all the time. Uh, it's a function of picking a handful of things and rotating through over time. So they're getting, they're getting multiple things over the long term. It's not generally beneficial to give anybody the same thing month after month, year after year. Um, but also when it comes to whether it's pets or people, whatever you're doing health-wise, you have to do something that's sustainable. And for me to say, I need you to give your dog these 25 supplements every day, plus feed them a fresh whole food diet, um, nobody's going to do it. Nobody's going to be able to maintain that. And if you can't maintain it, then what's the point? That's a very good point for humans as well, uh, which is why I, I go to great lengths uh, to make it easy for me to take all the supplements I take. You know, there, I have a, a dedicated closet with special shelves and it, like it's all set up so that I can quickly take the ones that I want to do. And even then some mornings I'm like, I don't want to take that one. And I just don't take it because my body didn't want it. So the same thing every day. I don't think your pets need that either. We haven't talked a lot about horses and it's funny because some of the best biohacks out there originate with racehorses. The first medical grade laser that I got 25 years ago, none of them were approved for humans, but I got one for racehorses that worked just fine on knees and jaws and joints and things. Mm -hmm. And some of the PEMF things. So racehorses are a great thing there, but they're such they're biologically so different from dogs and cats. I don't think most of what we're talking about here applies to horses, does it? Other than well, giving them I mean, food, food's very different. Yeah, yes and no. I mean, you know, clearly sort of the food discussion, uh, you know, nutritional requirements for a horse is a world of difference. Um, and I think the big thing to remember with horses, and I'll preface this by saying that, you know, I am not an equine expert. Um but horses, because of their physiology, as a rule, on a, on a sort of milligram per pound of body weight basis, if you will, the dosages of everything for horses are dramatically lower than they would be for people or dogs or cats, um, just because of the way they metabolize and absorb things. You couldn't just sort of take a, you know, a milligram per pound dose of some vitamin or pharmaceutical and just do the math and figure that out for a thousand pound horse. That would not work. But that said, you know, all of the hallmarks of aging, all of the biohacking still applies. Uh, mm -hmm. It's just going to take some adjustment when it comes to things that are, you're going to give internally. But to your point, uh, you know, laser, PEMF, even hyperbaric oxygen, ozone therapy, all that stuff, absolutely applicable uh, in, in the equine field. And, you know, horses, Horses are a fascinating creature. To me, they're a, they're a miracle of evolution that that body system works at all. Um, <laughs> the biomechanics of how horses works is it defies yeah. physics. They don't work that well. They break their legs a lot. I, I it's like a work. brick balanced on four toothpicks. It's a fascinating yeah. concept. Yeah, apparently it works evolutionarily, but uh, wow. It does. It's not, not really so well on the track, but generally speaking, it works. Right, right. <laughs> So it's it's really interesting that over the course of your career, you know, you've you've evolved these anti aging strategies for cats and dogs and just for all animals that are so similar to what they are for humans. We see that it works in animals, and the supplement stack is pretty similar. Uh, the other regenerative therapies like peptides, stuff yep. that I've talked about, rapamycin, uh, ozone yep. therapy, stem cell therapy, V cells. You're doing all this with dogs and cats. Um, yeah. Is there a human a biohack that just doesn't apply to animals? Well, I mean, I think there's a, so doesn't apply versus is just not practical. Um, I think doesn't apply, probably not. Not practical, probably the real big one would be something like plasmapheresis. Yeah, they're going to hold still for that long, right? Well, I mean, I think, I think realistically you could do it. It's just, I mean, it's so obscenely expensive. Yeah. Let's talk about that for a minute. A lot of people might not know what plasma paresis is. You might have seen I posted a while ago when I went down to RMI and, and did it in Costa Rica. This is when they take your blood out of one arm, filter out your plasma, and then put 
clean replacement plasma back in the other arm. So I, I have, you know, a, I think it's 2.6 liters of my plasma it looks like pee, but it's actually like changing the aquarium water around your red blood cells. But getting clean plasma, I think that's, I don't know, a $5,000 plus procedure. And if you want to do that for a horse, um, it's got to be, what, like 20 liters or something? I don't know how much blood a horse has, but it's a lot. Yeah, quite a bit. And the dogs, it would probably be cheaper, but then you have to hold still for two hours to do it. And it's, it, it would be very expensive. I, I can see why. Yeah. So, I mean, just the equipment alone to do that. Yeah. It's not something that's probably likely to be available in, in veterinary medicine anytime soon. It's a soon. dialysis machine. Like it's yeah, the same it's thing. Dialysis. Dialysis. That's exactly what it is. And, you know, like, like I say, it's so as a practical matter, not so much, you know, and then some of sort of like, some of these higher end uh, stem cell procedures are just not really practical. Although, uh, as you mentioned, I mean, we are doing V cell therapy in my office, uh, which we've had a lot of good success with. Uh, so that's that's been a lot of fun to do because it's. I mean, as from a you know from a financial perspective, it's really no more or less expensive than doing more conventional mesenchymal stem cell therapy. But the great news is, is there's no surgical collection of stem cells. So yeah. it's actually much easier on the patient to do it that way. Uh, so, that, so it works out great. So guys, what, what that is, it's very small embryonic-like cells. And there are these cells floating in your blood that are tiny and they act like stem cells even though they're not stem cells. And you can pull them out of the blood, you separate them out, you activate them with a laser or you activate them with uh, mm -hmm. ultrasound. And then you reintroduce them to a site of injury or back into the blood and you get a very similar effect to stem cells, but you don't have to suck out um, fat with liposuction or tap into the bone marrow. And I've had my fat taken out twice and my bone marrow taken out twice to do stem cell procedures over the last 10 years. Neither one of those is very comfortable and you wouldn't want to do it to your dog if you didn't have to and there's risk of you know surgical stuff. So this is like drawing blood, doing something magic to the blood, putting it back, pet gets better. So I, I love that you're doing that. Um, where's your office base? I realize the Upgrade Collective live audience is asking. I'm in the uh, San Francisco East Bay, specifically Oakland. Awesome. So your if old you're neighborhood. In, if you're in Northern California, uh, it's yes, sir. Oakland. All right. And your book. Uh, tell me the name of your book. The formal name of it. Uh, so there's two: Longevity for Dogs and Longevity for Cats. Got it. Those are the new ones. And the the other one that I have a copy of is the Ultimate Pet Guide. Is that the, the one? Ultimate Pet Health Guide? There you go. Got it. So those are your three big books uh, for, yes. for our pet lovers. Uh, and uh, how would one go about finding a really good longevity-focused vet in their neighborhood? Honestly, that's going to be, that is a, a, a tricky proposition from the standpoint of, I mean, longevity science is a pretty edgy even in human medicine. It, it may be even trickier to find a veterinarian in that sense, but a good place to start um, would be there is a holistic veterinary medical association uh, the website is ahvma.org. Uh, and if people go onto that website, they can find a veterinarian in their area. So at least they can start to look at integrative and whole health medicine, uh, and then perhaps have a conversation with one of those veterinarians with a, in, in the more specific longevity space. I think you'll be seeing more and more veterinarians kind of getting involved in longevity science as as it gains popularity, I think in many ways, uh, veterinary, veterinary medicine often sort of is following on the coattails of human medicine, maybe about 15, 20 years in the past. So, yeah. uh, so we'll get there, uh, it, but it may take a minute. In, in the meantime, and you're giving 40% off for listeners. I, you care a lot about, about pet health, and thank you for that massive discount. Sure. Go to ultimatepetnutrition.com. That's ultimatepetnutrition.com and use code PETHEALTH40 when you check out. So oh, thank you for that. So if you're listening and you have, you have pets, dogs, or cats, number one, read Longevity for Dogs or Longevity for Cats. Seriously, there are things you can be doing that are not expensive that can make your loved family member live longer and also just be more comfortable with their life. Um, and then get 40% off. Ultimatepetnutrition.com, use code PETHEALTH40 uh, to save a very meaningful amount on supplements and, and things that you need for your pets. Um, Gary, thanks for, for coming on today. 
I know we hang out at human longevity events, and I love how you've so elegantly applied this with a different lens for dogs and cats. I think you're going to make a huge difference in the health of pets because they need it. I appreciate it. And you have been a great inspiration. So, uh, so thank you. Ah, very, very welcome. Guys, if you love this episode, I would appreciate it if you shared a link with your friends who also have pets. Because biohacking isn't just for humans. The definition of biohacking is change the environment around you and inside of you so you have full control of your own biology. Well, part of the environment around you is other life forms, including your pets. And all the studies show having a pet raises your oxytocin, it makes you live longer, increases heart rate variability, uh, it makes your kids have healthier gut biomes if you have young kids at home. So yes, I don't have a pet right now. I'll probably go when I travel less. But I do really, really think that uh, you want to share this episode. Plus, 40% off is a massive, it might be the, the highest discount we've, I've seen on the show. So ultimatepetnutrition.com and use code PETHEALTH40. Gary, thanks, my friend. You are so welcome. Thank you. You're listening to The Human Upgrade with Dave Asprey. 